Greetings and welcome to Moving Forward, the program where we examine the Trinidad and Tobago music industry and try to propose a proper way forward. But as Black Stalin say, if we don't know from where we come in, then we can't plan where we go in. So we will examine the past and reflect on our victories and mistakes. I'm Robin Foster and I've been around in this business as a sound engineer, producer and studio owner for the last 40 years or so. Also hosting is another veteran, Mario Russell or DJ Mario. Downtown Outlaws founder and he is also a businessman and avid hiker and these days a music journalist. Today on Moving Forward, we talk to Carl Beaver Henderson, arranger, producer and music exec for with 50 years in the business. And as usual, Mario, we will um, go to you as to open the innings. Talk to Beaver. Hi, Beaver. Nice to see you again after all these so long. Um, so I'll get right into it. Um, give us a brief history of, of where you started, probably from school. And we'll ask questions along the way concerning... You know, because some of, but, you know, especially it's important, you know, I know to be in the business 50 years, it entails a lot of struggle. It entails a lot of hard times. I know that. And, you know, it is important that we learn some of these struggles so that other people could understand the business a little better. So go ahead and tell us when they start and, and what, how long it was. 50 years is a long time. The, the early stages, I mean, I'll just go briefly. Um, yeah. I knew I wanted to do this at the age of nine, put it this way. Um, some people, it happens gradually. Um, I, there was a particular evening. I know exactly when it happened. It was about between six and seven o'clock. It's like a spark, a light went off. And I kind of just realized this is what I wanted to be. Um, I obviously couldn't foresee where I am now, but I just knew this is the energy that I needed to travel. Um, you have to understand that I grew up in a, in those days, they were called an upper middle class house. My old man was a professor on campus. We grew up on campus. Um, so I had choice of different things. I mean, I was on my way studying to um, doing medicine. Um, but that was coming. That was the plan from school days, um, from very early. Um, started in St. Mary's, left for a while, um, went to the States. Uh, high school for a while and then came back and I think all that moving around is what kind of made me who I am today because you know especially at that kind of a as you would call sponge learning um, your mind is open so much in uh, them teenage days um, I was open to so many different cultures and I was living in the states at the time when Motown was at its peak you know um, James Brown, Aretha Franklin, Supreme's Temptations, Otis Redding, the whole nine yards so that had a heavy influence on me. And um, then I came back here, and again in a very musical family, uh, always in, surrounded by classical music, uh, big band music, jazz. Um, and my old man um, working with UE and uh, the FAO, United Nations, always traveling around, but always bringing back fresh music from wherever in the world he came, you know? So that was always brought into my mind. And then when I came back in St. Mary's, the, the great mistake happened. <laughs> Robin Imamsha and myself met each other. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, we again, I mean, up to this week, we spoke about it, you know. Um, it's only when we look back, we realize we created history. But obviously, the time you, you don't set out to create history, you just do what is, I guess, just natural, what your energy drives you from inside. And we were always getting in trouble in class and stuff like that. As a matter of fact, there was a teacher um, who basically put us at the back of the class because he said, swimmers and musicians, forget it, at the back of the class. Mm -hmm. So a couple of classes, we were like that. And then, um, you know, we were jamming music at home and stuff. And then we decided, um, I was in the choir, we were in the choir, and we decided to do a church, uh, folk mass in church because, you know, at those times, you know, you had to go to church. Everything was every Thursday in St. Mary's. Um, and we decided to do a, a, a mass. And with that happening, 
um, we made one big mistake because the number one song in the world at the time was My Sweet Lord. And um, we thought that was quite appropriate for us. And it worked well until we forgot that at the end of My Sweet Lord, in the People Roman Catholic Church, hmm. we were singing Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. Right. Um, so we were quietly expelled from folk mass. <laughs> and then, if you notice, the name of the first band was called La Supper. <laughs> ah, La Supper. Right. Or the La Supper. I mean, and, well, Robin had a little more design on that because, you know, I mean, we always had this kind of vision of a kind of multicultural thing. Afro, Indian, a Chinese, a local white. And so if you look at Last Supper, it was a cross section of all of Trinidad, you know. And it actually it happened at first, eh? and came from the students in St. Mary's, but it continued that way. Anyway, um, when Last Supper went on, we became quite successful. We did a lot of change. Um, Robin and myself, well, a lot of people don't know. Robin and myself were the ones who were the most out-of-the-box adventurous ones at the time in the industry, I guess because youth, youthful energy. And we started creating things like messing with technology and created the first PA kind of system. Um, not just the short columns, but starting combining things with Altec Lansing and JB Lansing boxes and all kind of different things. And John Afoon came around the time we built the first snake um, well, first you will smile at it. It was just six cables wrapped with um, electrical tape. So you could imagine the kind of humming, but we didn't care. We had a big PA, we had the first big PA system in the country, right? When everybody was still using these two sh small short columns. Mm -hmm. I, I remember Mano Marcelin passing me in West India Club and telling me, Henderson, where are you going with all that noise? I mean, <laughs> what was noise at the time here? You could fit in your bedroom now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, but Robin and myself have always been, always been adventurous when it comes to technology, right? Um, we went on to that, and after maybe about five, six, seven years of success, um, you know, you tend to, if something becomes routine, um, you want to grow it a little bit. And we ended up in studios. Now, even while all this was going on, uh, we were recording um, and that was the era where soca was in development. Um, mm -hmm. So in the early early 70s, um, we had a song called uh, Trinidad Boogie, Black Ball, and stuff like that. Um, that that's went, under the Last Supper name, right? Under the Last Supper name. And eventually Last Supper went to Love Trinidad. And the reason it went to Love Trinidad is because Robin had um, sweet soca song, La La La, T T T, mm -hmm. right? And because of the international marketing and, you know, dealing uh, with the label outside, it was more marketable to call him and act the band Love Trinidad instead of La Supper. Um, because, you know, I mean, La Supper globally will have some implications because of religions in different parts of the world and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we moved on with that. Um, so, Robin, we were recording a cage and... One day in rehearsal, Nigel Lafon came up to me in the rehearsal room and told me David Beresford and Stan Sherman and Sam wanted to see me. And so after rehearsal, I, you know, I thought maybe just a little quick thing and just to you know, discuss something for maybe one song or something. I met with them, and who was in the studio at the time was Gene Lawrence. And within a half an hour, I was in the studio. That was about seven o'clock the night. I left studio between six and seven the next morning. That was my first full-blown studio uh, experience. Um, I, I could ask a little question about Semp. Um, uh -huh. Well, the story I heard, in fact, Semp is where I first met you. First time I ever saw you. No, no, no. I saw you back in school days because I was friends with your little brother. And oh, we, yeah. Right? Um, but the first time I saw you, like, professionally, it was like, I saw you doing um, Poser in Semp, right? Okay. But uh, what I heard about Semp is that I remember my boy Frank Agarat and Colin Oliveri, I think, as yeah, we Oliver. worked TTT together, as he brought me down in Semp. Mm -hmm. I understood, tell me if I'm wrong, that um, who lived in Beresford or Shaman? Who was the one living in London? Shaman. Right. I heard that um, they say like his mother used to. 
um, feed a young struggling Cat Stevens. Cat Stevens, yeah. Um, and, the shamans and Cat Stevens were like family. Right. And, and when he finally made it as a big star, he sort of gave shaman money to come and build a studio in Trinidad. Any of that is true? Well, maybe it could have been assistance, but I know um, the obviously you have to have capital to start it. But uh, from what I understand, it was uh, financed by, um, I can't remember, it was DFC. DFC, D oh, all right. Yeah, okay. DFC. okay. Because they were dealing with ID, um, IDC, mm -hmm. IDC at the time. Yeah, okay. I and then remember. DFC, I think, were the finances and stuff like that. All right. So probably a little seed money or something. But, you know, yeah, yeah. You know we like to romanticize these stories now. No, but at the end of the day, even if you yeah. go with DFC, you can't go with you can't go with your hand swinging, eh? Oh, okay, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I just wanted to kind of know that because I heard them them stories and you know, and um, you know, I was just kind of curious. But um, okay, so we reached the point where you met Shaman and 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 you, and you met Gene Lawrence in his studio. Continue from there. Well, that first session was the keyboards for a whole album that night was Gene Lawrence, Sunset to Sunrise. Um, you remember, I think, it was, I think it was during the the last attempted coup, there was a song I think was playing on, on TV and on radio all the time with Gene Lawrence, Sunrise, the coup, coup. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That mm -hmm. line was my fullest line I played in Semp at that night. So anytime I hear it, it just has flashbacks to Semp that very first night. Yeah, and we completed all the additional work on the album that night. Um, and how how they actually called me to do that is because um, they had used different keyboard players at the time. Um, Gregory LaSalle, an old friend also from St. Mary's, who had a stint with Last Supper too. Um, he had played some stuff. Max Middleton, who was also the keyboard player for Jeff Beck Group, he did some of the stuff. Uh, Jeff Beck? Yeah. And I basically came and finished off all additional pianos, synths, strings, everything, because they needed, I think Max had, no, Max was starting another project at the time, which I can tell you in a bit about. Um, so he was on that side, he was producing something else. And um, I think Gregory LaSalle had migrated at the time. And that's what happened. Um, but as we were on there, we're talking about Max Middleton. Mm -hmm. uh, and just yesterday, I called actually, well, I don't know when this will be viewed. Yesterday was Valentino's birthday. And um, I spoke to Valentino. And one of my best studio experiences ever in life was witnessing the recording of an album, the Jazz Calypso album with Valentino. Um, the jazz version of Life is a Stage and Smokey Joe and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, that was Max Middleton from Jeff Beck Group. Um, Clive Sharman, which is Stanley Sharman's brother, bass player, also played with Jeff Beck. So two of them basically, um, along with Stanley Sharman, basically directed the album. Uh, Still one of the most underrated clips of albums ever. All right. And this would be about what year? Tell me the year. That would, this would, this would be somewhere by 75, 76. Yeah. Right. Um, because I remember in London, Jeff Beck had a popular album called Blow by Blow. And I think Richard Bailey played drums on it. Um, yeah. A 19 year old Richard Bailey, you know. So yeah. Richard, um, th that was the only time when Richard was moving around with, with Jeff Beck and OCB, sir. All right. Okay. All right. I think right. But he, he was still here, I think, and, uh, and Robert, he went back before Robert, I think. And Robert. I, I can't remember their timelines yeah. because I yeah. lost track of them after a while. Mm -hmm. But that whole era, uh, to me, was one of the most exciting eras of our industry here. Um, because that was the, the time when the change was taking place, a major change was taking place from what we call Calypso to Soka. Um, now, Robin, I think, has done it in, in his thesis at UTT. And Eventually, if we explain it carefully enough, the true story of Soka will come out, right? Um, I'm not taking anything away from Shorty. Um, Shorty planted the flag. Um, but if you notice up to today, Shorty invented S-O-K-A-H. All right. Right? We were moving with S-O-C-A. 
that is really the movement we are doing because it was more of a pop thing um, to some of us. All right. Well, as a, as a, I would have been probably, what, 13, 14 years old at the time, but I was a serious music aficionado and collector at the time. I had a million 45s, right? And mm -hmm. what I remember from that time, there, were, there was a lot of experimentation going on. I remember mm -hmm. having a record called um, Kai, um, Kai, so Kai Soul. Um, no, Kai Soul. Um, oh, yeah. Calypsoul. C-A-L-Y-P-S-O-U-L. And I remember... Clive Bradley had a song called Funkaiso, F-U-N-K-A-I-S-O, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of experimentation going on at the time, um, trying to get the music over. I mean, what the intention was to be to go international, right? Sell more records outside of Trinidad. Was that the intention? Yeah, you know, the weird thing is that era, it was never about sell here, sell international. I mean, we, we looked at it as a global market, right? And it was just an idea of just moving into territories, um, which has changed now. It's almost like all music border kind of closed up to a point and then it, it, it closed to the, to the Caribbean. We, we have limited ourselves as far as I'm concerned right now uh, because that era, there was so much creativity going on. Uh, Mario would tell you, um, mm -hmm. At any given week, I would be produce a Calypso this week, um, what we call soca the time the following week, um, a disco the third week, a piece of funk the next week. You know what I mean? We were just producing music um, and not worrying about which genre it fell into. We were just, it was all about producing good music and looking to get hits. Um, for instance, in those days, um, you know, I've heard in the last, what, 10 20 years, guys talking about, whoa, they sold 5,000 units. And the thing is, in those days, if I didn't sell anything like under seven, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 units of a production I did, I almost never even spoke about it. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So the idea was, uh, you know, you start talking about something when you have uh, nine, ten thousand 10,000 hits. Um, yeah. Well, units sold, digits. Um, when you have 15 and 20, yeah, you could be a little bragging rights a little bit. I remember you, um, you, people telling me... Um, you, you, run the, you run the week. Yeah, <laughs> like, I remember you, this you thing like... Mario's charts, right? Mm -hmm. Explainer would, um, would, would come in and collect $65,000 and, you know, at, you know for somebody working in some the time would tell me that, you know, like, so like there was... And there's a, some good money back in them days for artists to, to offer their sales of records that records right. records used to sell so yeah. um so the coming of the cassette did it kill the business yeah yeah i mean the piracy and in other words the availability of music became became more easily available then um so with that now uh, obviously your, your income dropped um and then afterwards the cd came made it easier to even also easier to duplicate after a while. And then the internet came and Napster and all that. And now you have Spotify and everything is streaming now, you know, um, like you would talk, to, you'll talk um, to any major artist around the world. In those days, guys could have done an album, going on tour to produce the album, um, to, to market the album, and then sit back and collect their royalties off of sales and whatever, and intellectual property for the next five years and, you know, live in the ranch and have a good life until the next album or the next two, three years and go back again. A lot of those arts, artists from that era <laughs> have had to hit the road again in the last five, ten years, you know, to supplement the income because that gravy train has gone. You know, there's no sales, I mean, but you know the story about streaming now. You know, the, the level of income they get from that is... So, if not I remember zero. you with um, Fireflight. I mean, that was like the revolutionize of the whole industry. As far as I remember, you know, Fireflight. I mean, you guys would dress up like Earth, Wind and Fire. Mm. And I mean, when everybody was looking at the Calypsos, Calypsonians, you all were mm. totally different. And, and it was like a revolution, you know, to see this band... And watch how they perform. 
and they look my my remembrance is is like earth wind and fire <laughs> right that kind of yeah. you know so you you're quite right i mean mm-hmm. um maurice white is still one of my idols as of today mm-hmm. uh, one of the greatest vocalists ever to walk the face of the earth to me still philip bailey right and then when you study the concept of what those guys had what maurice the vision maurice had um you know how they carefully planned what they were going to do and how they message themselves um i just took pattern from that um mm-hmm. it was not necessarily the same thing but the image happened to be the same thing because actually that was his style of image in the time because it wasn't just earth wind and fire you could have looked at groups like cameo mm-hmm. um a lot of the acts around that time you know when a lot of silver and glitter um and we used to wear what well locally is known as mass boots <laughs> you know right. knee high mass boots but bands like Earth, Wind and Fire were using it wasn't mass boots to them, you know. Mm-hmm. So what men were kind of kicking off at hey, Beaver and them wearing mass boots. But nobody in Earth, Wind and Fire could jump as high as you and Dane Grell, right? <laughs> well, you know, well, I I'm remember still, Beaver jumping like 10 foot off the ground uh, playing in Firefly. Outside of people in the Ma- Ma- Maasai tribe in, in Africa, I, I haven't <laughs> seen anybody jump the way I have jumped. So I feel I have some kind of connection back to that original root, that so, blood root. So what what year was right. the the launch of Fire Flag? Fire Flag was 81. 81. Right? Yeah, okay. um, yeah 1981. It started to be planned in like an 80 and stuff like that. Because what was happening is back in Simp, um with the whole surge and movement of going towards soca music. It was happening mainly in two studios, Simp Studios and Cage Studios. All right. Um but it wasn't really a studio thing. It was a musician's thing that was happening more, more or less a musician's thing because musicians were experimenting. So besides Clive Bradley, there was um, David Boothman, Michael Boothman, um, gosh, um, Ed Watson had his own sound, right? Robin was experimenting with S-O-U-N-D, um, um, Robin Imam Shah, that is, um, where Robin, his, his kind of, reputation for, at the time, was the best bass drum sound in the Caribbean, right? He was messing audio-wise with sounds. And that whole thing with, you know, African drum, the Indian drum and stuff, and Shorty was around the time in, in Cage. And from what I understand, there was a discussion down there, and Shorty wanted to do his thing, but they were going to limit him to some kind of publishing, and, and he was not, you know, willing to settle for that. So he left Cage and came to Semp, where I was, right? And that is where he did the album. I think the first official, official album of Soka, I think, was Endless Vibration. Endless right. Vibration was done in Semp? Um, it was no, in- that was done in Cage, I think. No, no, no. I'm trying to remember which is, is, a, is a gold. I remember it was a gold, a kind of bronze-colored one. The album where he explained Soka for the first time. Remember there was a song called uh, Memphis Soul Stew? Memphis Soul Stew, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Or Curtis. Curtis, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, right. Curtis. King Curtis. Um, what's Curtis? King Curtis. Yeah. Right. And took the same format and started talking about, you know, um, this is soca music and stuff. That that album is where it was officially planted. He planted the flag. I mean, he was there before, but he officially planted the flag with that album. Well, um, right. well, you know, um, Mongol Patesa was explaining to me that um, he said Shorty told him that there was uh, um, some guy called Narain living next to, to Shorty that he Shorty used to hear him playing this dolak, and mm. Shorty took the 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 bass side of the dolak, the boom, boom, and and tell them to play it on the on the bass guitar, and then uh-huh. and then they took the um. And basically, that kind of doom, doom, boom, became what we call the soca bass, you know, coming out of right. And Pelham, Pelham Goddard also said um, that he think it has credibility to that because he even did some of that, um, like with Super Blue and thing, you know, use that whole, that kind of dola kind of sound, you know, that fusion, right? Indian again, music. Again, you have to, you have to understand. All right, so let, let's deal with the. Evolvement, I should say the evolution. Yeah, no, but say I wanted to use a different word, evolution, because it was so intricate and cross-thread. 
like, like Trinidad, the, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was it was like a, a, a parallel thing going on. Shorty definitely was creating his SOKH, right? Right. Um, but that started in KH with um, what they were experimenting. He was part of the experiment. Robin was part of it, right? But they were, although they were kind of moving forward, they weren't moving forward collectively. So everybody was in their own little creative space. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the, the change came about is when, I guess, short for business purposes, Shorty wasn't willing to um, give up his rights for, I guess, maybe publishing and under their label kind of situation. But his thing was S-O-K-E-H. Right. So Mangal was saying the beat yeah, he took. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Sorry. Sorry. K-H Studios, because mm-hmm. they were starting to deal with international labels and production. Um, and that's one of the things when Robin did La 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 T-T-T, right? So Three Talk a Song. SOCA was, I think, from understanding for marketing purposes, was the sound of the Southern Caribbean. All right. It wasn't so. It, was, so, it wasn't Soul Calypso. No, it it, it was um, the marketing name was the sound of the Southern Caribbean because remember around that time, Casey and the Sunshine Band had the sound of Miami. Okay. Yeah, I remember. Mm-hmm. So everybody then they had um, the sound of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. You know, MS, MFSB. Uh, TSOP, um, Sound of Fil- So everybody had a sound. So this was going to be, from what I understand, the sound of the Southern Caribbean. Okay. Um, and, but some of us were just doing music. We, we, I was not interested in name, and I was just creating music, you know. All right. Uh, so there were marketing people who were deciding, you know, names and stuff like that. But even though you, you spoke about actually about the bass drum, doom, 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 doom. Mm-hmm. What was actually as important, if not more important, was the second note of that bass you're talking about was the floor tom. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, because soca at that time was really almost like a team. Same thing with the bass is playing. And the first note was either on the se- first or second tom, mm-hmm. or sometimes the snare. And the last note was on the floor tom. So you just, you normally you normally get like, you know? Okay. And that, and that is where... And the super, thing the is, um, Mongol was saying that that particular Indian rhythm he took um, was called the Kahalwa beat, right? And and he's saying that you know the 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 the, the ka, you know, um, he's saying that he, he doesn't think it was consciously, but he said it was something something um, something mystic <laughs> that you know, shorty. Although Shorty didn't particularly know that 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 there was something, you know, in this in the spirit realm then <laughs> about that. Yeah, but um, let me tell you, let me tell you at the end, at the end of the day, mm-hmm. um, those single repeated things, I mean, have history back onto the other side of the world. Right. Because it okay. came it came from the Dolak and stuff. But then again, you'll talk to Martin who has it down to science where the original African rhythm was doop 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 doop. Right? When you say uh, Martin. Raymond. Oh, right? Martin. Right? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I would not even, you know, try to go into detail. He has, he has studied that and given names and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that in history. Mm-hmm. Um, so, in other words, the original rhythms, one of the original rhythms coming out of Africa was that. And they claim that rhythm is which on all oh, music no, um, is, is done. That's what they call the, cla- no, that's the, that's the clave. That that is the exactly. what that is what the it it was a, a, a Orisha rhythm basically from Nigeria, but they said the 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 Ghanaian fishermen brought it back to Ghana and it basically this is it pop 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 the um the Spanish call it um the people in Cuba in Cuba they call it the clave, right? Which is kind of the ba- the ba- the basis of all popular music. Yeah, but there's a reason for that too. If you listen to Spanish music, that is what they played on the instrument, the clave, the two little wood sticks. Tick, right. Yeah. Yeah. Tick, yeah. Tick, tick, yeah, right? but the beat itself. Yeah, but and you listen to that. Listen to the sound of Miami, for instance. No. Remember? Yeah, they say everything okay. is everything is the clave. Right. Everything is that that five those five Yoruba yeah, notes. This, is remember, the, is remember, the, um, remember George McCree. Um, um, mm-hmm. uh, I get left. Rocky, Rocky Boat. No, no, no. That was Hughes Corporation, Rocky Boat. Yeah, Rocky Boat. Rocky yeah. Baby. Yeah. Right? Uh, I get lifted. They actually use the clave to open the song. Mm. Tick, 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 
tick, tick. Right. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's yeah. so many different hybrids of it. No, I yeah, no, yeah. No, no. There's a note. good documentary the BBC did called Five Notes That Changed the World. That and it's the whole the story of that. Right? Yeah. You could and Google it. Next side, no. On the next side with the Dolak, um, well, somewhere along the line in the very early of Last Supper, we interacted with um, East Indian musicians. And then plus, um, Harry Mahabe was a dear friend of mine. And then Harry Mahabe was in Semp recording almost every month, you know, that kind of situation. Um, so the dola, um, you almost like, a, even though when guys cut in, you always waited for them to settle back into, there's a, there's a mm-hmm. kind of a lock uh, that, that they, they do. Uh, once you settle that, then you can play anything on top of that. 